Our next speaker is Sama Al Hamdani, who is an independent writer, researcher, and analyst focusing on Yemeni politics and women affairs. In the past year, she has provided Yemen analysis to the United States Institute of Peace. Her work has been published in El Monitor, the Lawfare Blog of Brookings, uh, the National UAE um, Middle East North Africa Source, the Atlantic Council Blog, El Arabi Al Jadid, uh, Fikra Forum, the Middle East Institute Journal, Quartz Magazine, Yemen Observer, Yemen Times, and several other prominent publications and academic journals. She also writes the blog Yemeniati. Uh, dot com since 2010. She's a regular expert commentator on Yemeni political affairs for major international media outlets, including CNN International, CNN America, BBC World Service, Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera America, Huffington Post, RRTV American, RTTV International, France 24, Chinese CCTV, Canadian CTV, and Al Qura News. Welcome. <coughs> for the long, long <laughs> introduction. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try something different. And I hope that it's exciting to kind of learn about Yemen this way, because I think it's a country that's often misunderstood. And it's often viewed in terms of the Saudi-Iranian proxy war lens only. And it's far more complicated than that. So what I actually want to do is I want to play a short video and I want to pause it along the way, and we can delve in further uh, where I explain the background to the statements made and who's exactly doing what. And so I actually chose a TRT film, because a lot of channels now, they do these little films that are explainers of what's going on. And I think that they actually did a very good job at remaining um, focused on what the issue is and not being bias as one would assume from some of the media outlets in the Middle East and in the region around it. Um, so let's uh, Is there a way to fix the volume? Thank you. Um, so while this is happening, <laughs> I want us to bear in mind that Yemen as a country is a relatively young country. There used to be North Yemen and South Yemen, and so this identity of being Yemeni is relatively new. Um, pretty much the majority... The majority, more than half the population, is actually under the age of 25, so they do know and recognize Yemen as one country. But moving forward in the future, there's a high, like, a high chance that Yemen is not going to continue to be one country. And that's something that you don't hear about a lot in the media. There's this assumption that once the war stops in Yemen, Yemen will continue to be one country. start stopping and this is the pace that we're going to go at. So like you saw in the chart, Yemen is a poor country compared to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries surrounding it. We do have three oil pipelines in Yemen that are still functional, but they don't have a lot to give to the world. The, the advantage of Yemen though is, and this is a theory that's constantly spoken about, is that having access to Yemen geographically Saudi Arabia would be able to have act to extend its, wa uh, its pipelines and oil outside of Saudi Arabia through Yemen. And what they want is to have a region in the Arabian Sea where they can control where the oil goes and what happens. And, and that's actually something that's happening right now. Uh, in Yemen, there is a city to the very east of the country that's called Al-Mahara. And there is a deal at the moment through which 
Saudi Arabia is going to have its oil run through Al Mahara Governorate. And that's something that no one in the news is picking up on because the focus is the humanitarian crisis. How did Yemen reach war today? It really began with the Arab uprisings in a sense. Ali Abdullah Saleh at that point had been in power for 23 years. He's been president ever since the creation of Yemen since 1990, and he was the president of the north of Yemen prior to that. So total, by the time that the uprisings happened, he was in power for 33 years. So by the time that the uprisings happened, he naturally did not want to give up that power. And it took an assassination attempt on his life where they, there is a group that was never identified, um, but there are many theories about who's behind that assassination attempt. Um, so while the president, the former president, Al Abdullah Saleh, was praying in his own private mosque in the presidential palace, there was uh, a bomb that went off. And it really shook him up that they were able to infiltrate his social circle, the inner social circle that he was praying with. And I think he realized that he needed to kind of strike a deal to step down from power. And to step down from power, the GCC, which is the Gulf Corporation Council, mediated a, a deal where he steps down and his vice president becomes president. One of the biggest protests came from a politically motivated Shia rebel group called the Houthis, which had been at war with the Saudi government for years. Saleh was toppled and forced to hand over his position to this guy, Abdurrabbu Mansour Hadi, his former vice president, who's since been running the government. So they very briefly touched on who the Houthis are, and the Houthis are a huge, important actor in the conflict that we see today in Yemen. The Houthis are named after the founding father of the movement, Badr al-Din al-Houthi. It's actually a last name of a family. And the Houthis lived in the very northern portion of Yemen in a place called Sada, and it's right on the borders of Saudi Arabia. Now, people can disagree as to what caused the Houthis to form this movement, but it's very clear that in their area, in Sada, there was a school that was established, a Sunni school that was established in, in a traditionally Zaydi area. So the Houthis are Zaydis, which is uh, a sect of uh, Shiaism that really is nothing like Iranian Shiaism. Um, they usually call Zaydis Fiver Shias because they believe in the first five Imams, while most, uh, most Shias believe in 12 Imams. So you can see they've missed a few Imams in between. Um, the, the thing about the Houthis is that they started a rebellion against the government as early as 2000. And, and it started into a series of violence where the government ended up engaging in six separate wars against the Houthis. In one of these wars, Saudi Arabia directly <laughs> intervened and assisted the government in fighting them. They started as a group that had a grievance. Uh, they were neglected, their part of town was neglected, and then there was a Sunni school that was established in their area that became one of the biggest Wahhabi schools in the Arabian Peninsula. And that school became known as the School of Dammaj. And as a matter of fact, the School of Dammaj is known in the U.S. because there were a few bombers that came to the U.S. that studied there to, at some point. And that includes the underwear bomber. I don't know if you guys remember mm -hmm. that guy. He went to the School of Dammaj. So in 2012, when the uprisings were happening and when President Abdurrabbo Mansour Hadi came to power, a lot of groups that had grievances in Yemen managed to come to the capital to protest what they were feeling. And so in 2012, that was really the first time that anybody who fought with the Houthis or had anything to do with them managed to come to the capital, Sana'a, for the first time. And here they are taken to the streets with everybody else saying, hey, we don't want this president. And of course, on the streets at the time, the only other organized faction in Yemen, besides uh, the faction that supported presi former President Ali Abdullah Saleh, was the Muslim Brotherhood in Yemen. And the Muslim Brotherhood is actually part of a party in Yemen. So we have a political party called Islah. Islah is composed of three main streams. One of them is the Muslim Brotherhood. But it's also a, a really unique mix of um, tribes. And the organization of it is, is very fascinating because they also include Wahhabis in the same party. 
when the when the protests happened in 2012, the Islah party was the most organized party. They managed to organize the streets, and in a sense, a lot of the independent protesters felt like their own protest was hijacked by their organization. They were absorbed into the into the protests that Islah arranged. That thing got complicated. A UN sponsored national dialogue was established to address the future of the country, and a new federal system was agreed on. But tensions flared again when a proposal was made to divide Yemen into six federal regions. The Houthi Okay, so I'm gonna stop real quick. In 2012, when the president stepped down, so you have Saleh right over there, that's the former president. Right next to him is President Hadi. What happened with this transition is that the UN decided that they're gonna help assist Yemen and uh, through the transition and save it from civil war. So the solution was to have a national dialogue conference. And the national dialogue conference was meant to bring all kinds of Yemenis to the table where they can really negotiate the kind of government and the, and the kind of Yemen that they would like to live in. The problem with that is that the UN and the international community, I mean a lot of countries from around the world, including the US, came and really wanted to support this idea of the UN helping Yemenis discover what they want to have through a UN process, meaning they brought all the Yemenis to conference rooms, they divided them into nine main groups, and each group had an important subject to discuss. Uh, for example, they would discuss military restructuring, uh, another, another committee would discuss um, federalism and the shape of Yemen. The problem is this dialogue ended up having 565 members in it. None of the committees actually ended up interacting with each other the right way. And the actual decision leaders f were not present at that dialogue. Their proxies were, but for example, Saleh wasn't part of that process. Um, Abdel Malik Al Houthi was not part of that process. Uh, the head of the Wahhabi uh, faction in, in Yemen was not part of that process. So it was this elaborate show of how do we get to democracy without actually including people who had power on the ground. And that dialogue resulted into how, what is Yemen gonna look like? And the funny thing is, is even before the dialogue began, President Hadi made an interview uh, with the newspaper, he had an interview and he actually announced that he'd like to see Yemen be uh, divided into sec six federal regions and that happened to be the outcome of the national dialogue, that happened to be the findings of the national dialogue. Uh, and so the entire process was heavily influenced by outsiders, it was supported no matter what, and it was really remote from what the Yemenis were dealing with on the ground. So the two, two most um, neglected groups in this national dialogue, in a sense, were the Houthis, who come from the north, and then there's another group in Yemen that nobody talks about in the media as much, which is the southern separatist faction. Because Yemen used to be two countries, when this happened, people who used to belong to the south of Yemen feel like they don't want to be part of a Yemen. They want to secede. They want their own south to come back again. And so the separatists, the, there's, there's a huge movement, and I'm sorry to get complicated here. Uh, so the southern separatist uh, group is known as Hirak in Yemen, but Hirak does not refer to one group. It's an umbrella term that's thrown around to anybody who wants to secede from the north of Yemen. But then the problem with that is when you look at who wants to secede in the south, there are those who want to secede and establish a Wahhabi state. There are those who want to secede and establish a liberal state. There are those who want to secede and then have their own uh, emirates within. They can't agree on what the South would look like, but they only agree in the sense that they want to secede. Anything past that, they can't agree on. So I'm gonna just quickly go back so we can play through this. Into six federal regions. Houthis and a southern separatist movement called the Herai objected to the proposal, saying it was undermining their own distinct <coughs> interests and national vision. The Hadi government, which seemed like the best solution at the time, wasn't able to maintain order, and groups like Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Daesh took advantage of the political instability across the country. 
In the meantime, the Houthis were also making territorial gains, but lacked military power. Their next move came as a surprise. So, just real quick. While the national dialogue was taking place, the Yemeni government was supposed to carry out its duties per usual. So you had something called the consensus government, which was supposed to be the best thing that could have happened to Yemen because it included people from different political parties and it was supposed to be inclusive. Instead, what we saw happen in Yemen is a group of people who had no experience in government came to power and couldn't really carry out tasks for two reasons. One, they didn't have the experience and two, the former, the former people who were in power refused to give up their power. And people who <coughs> pledge allegiance to these guys refused to recognize the new people in power and just wanted to recognize the older people. In 2014, when the national dialogue was concluded, the Houthis did not seem like they wanted to adhere to the principles of the national dialogue. They crept from the very north of Yemen all the way down to the capital of Sana'a. So if you look at this map, the Houthis are right here. It's the yellow spots. They actually went all the way down to the capital of Sana'a. And they took advantage of the fact that Hadi's government was very weak. They couldn't, uh, when they went to Sana'a, the Hadi government at the time didn't even resist them. There was no, everybody heard about the Houthis coming to Sana'a and it's been building up for days, but when they actually went into the capital to capture it, the military put no resistance whatsoever. And so shortly after, the Hadi government actually struck a deal with the Houthis. They struck a deal called uh, the Peace and Partnership Treaty, where they were going to share power together. Now what's interesting is you have the vice president, the former vice president of Yemen, now president. And the former president of Yemen no longer in power, but he's in charge of everything, even though he's not in power. And naturally, what would happen is that the new president and the former president really hated each other. They really, really, really personally hated each other, which meant that when the Houthis came to Sana'a and there was no armed resistance from anyone, I think that the government thought that they could be partners with the Houthis. Then it was revealed to the government that they had actually struck a deal, not with the new president, but with the former president, which really upset <coughs> the new government. How dare you strike a deal with someone that we are trying to remove from power, who's refusing to hand power over to us? And this is where the genesis of the war comes. Total gains, but lack military power. Their next move came as a surprise. They turned to Saleh, the once sworn enemy, knowing that it still had military forces loyal to him. And Saleh saw this as an opportunity to regain his title. So the two sides collaborated. So interesting fact here, um, when the Houthis came into Sana'a, they did the peace and partnership treaty with the, with the new president, but the Houthis kept really undermining everything that the government was trying to do. Uh, they put their own guards outside of every government building where they ran their own security. They didn't trust anyone and they created their own checkpoints. They, they just started running everything, um, which when they started doing that, it forced the prime minister of Yemen to resign. And when the prime minister of Yemen resigned, the president got upset and said that he also resigns. So when he announced his resignation, the Houthis put him under house arrest in Sana'a. And then President Hadi managed to escape to the city of Adan, which is a port city. It's, it's also the former capital of the south of Yemen. So when he escaped there, he announced that he is withdrawing his resignation and that that resignation was announced under duress. And then he flew to Riyadh. And this is really important only in the sense that we constantly refer to President Hadi as the legitimate president of Yemen. And I think it's to override the fact that at some point he resigned and then unresigned, and then he ended up in Saudi Arabia. Another important fact to the to contention of his legitimacy is the fact that he was supposed to be a transitional president for only two years, after which Yemen was supposed to have elections to elect a new president. That those two years have now, you know, since 2012, we're now 2018, our president is residing in Riyadh and is still the legitimate president of Yemen. 
Now, the Houthis advanced to the West Bank at the Strait of Riyadh because it said Iran is backing the rebel group, and sharing a long border means stronger Iranian influence could seep into the country. So Saudi Arabia responded to Hadi's pleas and formed a coalition. They set up an air and sea blockade, then it launched an aerial campaign with the aim of driving the Houthis out and restoring the country's internationally recognized government. Local observers in the Yemen Data Project say almost a third of the Saudi-led coalition airstrikes have targeted non-military zones, such as marketplaces, schools, hospitals, wedding ceremonies, and even funerals. In the meantime, the United States began carrying out its own campaign. So, I'm not going to delve too much into Saudi Arabia because I know the next speaker is going to get into that, and maybe we can tackle it more in the Q&A section. No? <laughs> So, um, interestingly enough, when the Houthis were in the capital of Sana'a and when they were pushing President Hadi out, uh, King Salman was not in power. And it seemed at the time that Saudi Arabia didn't mind the Houthis as much as the new king. So when King Salman came to power, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman thought that, I think that this is a great way for me to assert myself as a new face in the political arena. I want to launch a war in Yemen to defeat the Iranians there, to kind of create cohesion in Saudi Arabia by launching this war in Yemen. Um, a lot of the experts who know a lot about Saudi Arabia and Iran, they know that Iranian influence in Yemen is nothing compared to what it is in Syria and Iraq and in other areas. So to react so aggressively and so violently to a threat that could have been contained through diplomacy uh, seemed rather odd, <laughs> but once you understand uh, Mohammed bin Salman's intentions, and also the idea that he thought that this was going to be a quick war. He didn't think that this is going to be, we refer to Yemen vis-a-vis uh, -vis Saudi Arabia as Saudi Arabia's Iraq. Once you go in, you don't know when to pull out. Um, the U.S. has a huge role in this, and not just the U.S., the U.K., France, Spain, they are the ones supplying the weapons for this war. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the number one uh, purchaser of American weapons, and a lot of these weapons are used in Yemen, and this is where the controversy comes about. Saudi Arabia has not, even though they've been launching the war for three years, they've not really perfected their targeting and continue to miss every once in a while, targeting civilians and children. And when these weapons turn out to be American-made, like Raython or Lockheed Martin, when they discover that these weapons are Americans, it creates controversy and backlash on America. Actually, up until this morning, uh, Sau Saudi Arabia depended on Americans to refuel their jets in the air. So for example, there'd be a plane carrying out an airstrike that'd go back in the air, refuel through an American jet, and then go back and carry out another airstrike. And this is something that the Congress and the Senate here tried to uh, say that they would like America not to do this in Yemen. And just this morning, they announced, um, uh, the DOD announced that they will no longer be refueling these planes uh, for Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia can now refuel their own planes midair. And I wonder where they got those planes from. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what's happening is that there's mounting pressure now three years in that the humanitarian catastrophe that's happening in Yemen is weighing on the shoulders of America because America and Saudi Arabia are such great partners that especially with the death and SS, uh, well, the execution of Jamal uh, Khashoggi in Turkey, there's a lot of attention on Yemen suddenly. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> targeted non-military zones, such as marketplaces, schools, hospitals, wedding ceremonies, and even funerals. In the meantime, the United States began carrying out its own campaign in Yemen. Not only was it supplying the Saudi-led coalition with billions of dollars worth of weapons, but also targeting Al-Qaeda and Daesh. By the end of 2017, the tables began to turn. Former President Saleh, who for months allied with the Houthis, offered to put an end to the fight with the Saudi-led coalition. But this move was seen as treacherous by the Houthis. And about 48 hours later, this was a huge, huge shock to a lot of people. For people like me, I was born with, with President Saleh in power. So for him to just be dead so quickly, 
uh, almost destroyed this reputation that we had of him as someone who will never go away, the clung to power no matter what. But for years with this conflict, it's, it, you know, we've been hearing from the ground that President Saleh is no longer in charge. The Houthis took all the military capacity that this man had. The three years of conflict, what it did in a sense is make the Houthis stronger. The Houthis came as a militia with the airstrikes coming in and to note, the airstrikes were coming in to a portion of Yemen. So if you are under Houthi control and you don't support the Houthis, you're going to have to live through airstrikes. You're going to have to, like, you are in danger of being killed. And then on top of it, the Houthis pretend that they are defending that part of the land. And they also seized all the military capacity, like all the weapons that the military had in the territories that they controlled, which made them that much stronger. Rebels were now being targeted from all sides, and most of Saleh's supporters became anti-Houthi. Meanwhile, the Hadi government was battling a new enemy, separatist forces in the south, backed militarily and financially by the United Arab Emirates. While the UAE is still part of the Saudi-led coalition, it is set to be continuing efforts to maintain a strategic foothold in the south, crippling the once united campaign against the Houthis. So... It's not just Saudi Arabia that's involved in this war. It's actually an Arab-led coalition, but it's mostly UAE and Saudi Arabia that are carrying out this campaign. The UAE does not make it into the news as much as Saudi Arabia because they're far more experienced in this and they know how to work from behind the scenes. The UAE actually deployed people into Yemen. They have soldiers on the ground, which is something that Saudi Arabia would never do in Yemen. They would never do it because from previous experiences, most soldiers that go into Yemen and they don't know the Yemeni terrain, they tend to be killed very quickly. Um, and so the UAE was supporting Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is supporting the legitimate president of Yemen, but the UAE is far more practical than that. They want to have actual influence on Yemen and they realize that the Yemeni government doesn't have any real influence besides international recognition. So what the UAE is doing is striking alliances with people on the ground that n don't necessarily want the Yemeni government in power. So here you see a split between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, right? So the UAE will work with anyone who's against the Houthis, who's against the Muslim Brotherhood, that they know controls the ground and can, you know, they can build their relationship with. Now, what they're doing is really undermining the Saudi narrative of restoring the government back to power. But experts warn it's not just the UAE. All members of the coalition are pursuing their own agendas. And each side of the conflict stands to have violated humanitarian and international law. Getting an accurate death toll is difficult. In 2017, the UN said that at least 10,000 Yemenis had died. And to date, that number hasn't been updated. More than 3 million people have been displaced. And millions of Yemenis trapped in the conflict are at dire risk of starvation and disease. So where are we now? President Hadi is based in Saudi Arabia, but his government still operates out of Ireland. And the conflict between the separatists, Houthis, and forces of loyalty to him are still ongoing. So just quickly again, Bin Dagr over here, he's been fired. And uh, the interesting thing about Hadi's government is the only constant in his government is President Hadi and a handful of people, including the Yemeni ambassador to the US. Everybody else tends to have very short terms. They're constantly replaced. And a lot of people see that if you have a position with the Yemeni government, then it's a really quick way to make money from Gulf support. So it's a really easy way to become a minister, to have the post, but then to also make a lot of financial wealth for yourself, either by receiving gifts from the Gulf countries or by getting involved in the smuggling processes of what's happening in Yemen, because the war economy is its whole other discussion. Um, what we see today also is that the Houthis, when the war started, they were never able to strike a missile into, into Riyadh. Three years in, the Houthis have the capacity to launch missiles into Saudi Arabia. So how does that happen? If you are fighting something, how does it get stronger? And is war the best solution for Yemen? So with everyone running their own agendas, what we have ever seen in this war. 
So I hope that wasn't too much. And I hope that it gives everybody a brief and good background about what's happening in Yemen. Um, do I do my Q&A session? Um, probably you should wait until after the Philip's time. So I hope that was informative. Thank you for listening, and I'm eager to take your questions. <laughs>